much like to echo the thanks in uh, being invited. It's an honor to be here um, to uh, talk to all of you and to share some of the experiences that we've had over the last several years. I've been very fortunate to be one of a very large group of people that have actually gone through the process in these last several years of translating a new imaging technology from mouse to man. What I'm going to do is to tell you about what was involved in that and share maybe some of the pain that was involved in that as well as the, the pleasure. Um, the motivation for what we're doing uh, is to really improve the ability to be able to evaluate, in particular, in my case, cancers, but in fact applies to many different diseases, uh, where, as was mentioned, metabolic characteristics of the disease can really tell you more information than just the anatomy. And what we wanted to do was to be able to monitor dynamic changes in those metabolic processes, which really impact the biology of the disease. And we also, because a lot of parts of the body, I, I work a lot in the brain, and that's easy because it doesn't move very much. But the rest of the body does move and deform. And so we really want to be able to uh, look at regions where we need to acquire the signal relatively fast. As I said, we also want to assess disease activity. And another key was to develop a platform where we could evaluate drug effects in a preclinical environment and then directly translate those results across to the human. So here's the concept. It's rather surprising and rather, um, my first reaction when I heard about it is this is never going to work and never going to be practical. And of course, I'm standing here, so it was practical in the end. Um, I, was, I did not develop this technology. It was developed so by some very clever scientists um, over a period of years, um, uh, most of them in uh, Malmo in Sweden, uh, in, uh, working uh, uh, in both industry and academia. The idea is you take a very small sample, as represented here, and that sample contains a mixture of a, of a carbon-13 labeled compound with an electron donor, as represented by these little dots here. And the electron donor is able to, uh, um, able to um, produce a, a lot more polarization, a lot more potential signal um, than, the, uh, than the nuclear donor. And so what one wants to be able to do is to transfer the energy from these electrons to the, to the uh, neutrons. And how do you do this? Well, first of all, you take a magnet. This is a 3.35 Tesla magnet. It's also been done at 5 Tesla. Um, so this is the kind of magnet you would see in any chemistry lab. Um, you have liquid helium, and uh, you put your sample inside this liquid helium bath. That's about 1 degree Kelvin. So it's really, really cold. Uh, a small sample here. And what you do is you increase the polarization of these nuclei by a combination of the low temperature, as well as bombarding the sample with a microwave source, which actually transfers the uh, polarization from these electrons to the neutrons. So now you have a very nicely uh, polarized signal that potentially could produce very large signal if you could get it into a biological sample, but it's sitting at one degree Kelvin. And so the real trick that these people are involved in, not only developing this methodology, but also how do you get it out of there and very rapidly get it into the biological sample that you want and make the measurement. So what we call the dissolution process lifts this sample out of the liquid helium bath. It takes a very hot liquid um, that goes in under pressure and then uh, comes out again and you collect it in a little sample tube. You need to take that little sample tube and you need to inject it, run like hell to the magnet, <laughs> inject it into the sample, and then make your measurement. And all the time that you're doing this, the signal is decaying with a characteristic relaxation time of the particular compound that you're dealing with at that particular temperature. So it's a, it's a challenging process, and you have about uh, two to three minutes in order to be able to get from here to there and make your measurement. Now, there are some very special uh, considerations when you're uh, developing this technology. One of them, as I said, is that the signal decays fairly rapidly. Um, the second one is that because you're taking something and injecting it into somebody and then measuring that signal, every time you do a data acquisition, um, you remove some of the signal. So you have to design your application in order to be able to take account of the fact the signal's going away as you're measuring it. Also, you're injecting a compound, so you have a bolus delivery of the signal. So you have to think about that when you're interpreting the results as well. And then, typically, depending on what compound you inject, 
it may undergo metabolic changes actually when it gets into the tissue. And that's really the key that we're interested in, not only being able to uh, follow the, the metabolite itself, but also being able to see these transitions uh, to different compounds and be able to measure reaction rates uh, that are going on within the tissue. So the first compound that was decided to be injected and was, was the first example is uh, uh, pyruvate. And pyruvate, depending on um, the biological needs of the tissue, can get converted into mitochondria and go through the TCA cycle, or it can get converted into lactate um, in uh, circumstances where we have anaerobic metabolism going on, or it can get converted into alanine. And when you make a measurement, and this is a measurement of, of the spectral decomposition of the signal, uh, the carbon-13 signal, you can see these various peaks, and each of the peaks corresponds to a different compound. The relative intensities of these peaks tell you how much of that compound is there. And one of the nice things is that with the carbon-13 compound, we're able to see fairly distinct peaks, unlike the rather, uh, rather uh, broad ones that we saw just now. These are relatively distinct peaks that can be followed. Now, what are the time limitations, practical limitations for the person? So these are the estimates of the time it takes if you inject something into the arm intravenously uh, in order to be able to get to the various components of the body. So obviously it goes very rapidly to the heart. And if you want to do heart applications, that's something that uh, is, is really very accessible. If you want to do brain, as, as I do, um, we're typically talking about 20 seconds to get into the brain. Uh, the prostate, which was the first application that we, we considered, takes about 15 seconds. And obviously, that's a very, very small amount of time. You have to optimize everything in order to be able to get it there. So we began with preclinical studies. Uh, this is a, a polarizer, the, the instrumentation in which you do the polarization and, and generate the agent that we're interested in. Um, the first experiments we did in mouse, mouse and rats. In fact, the very first ones were in rats because it's slightly larger than the mouse and gives you a slightly higher signal. And the idea was to investigate um, the tumor progression and response to therapy and see what our me measurements were able to give us. And then also, of course, we needed to develop new magnetic resonance techniques which were able to measure the signal as fast as we wanted to and be able to return the information that we needed. And then, of course, we also want to investigate different kinds of carbon-13 labeled agents which would give us different signals and be able to investigate different metabolic processes. And this is the setup in our, uh, our old uh, three Tesla magnet uh, for doing an animal experiment. I mean, you can just see the, the coil that we used for the rat and here's the anesthesia system. Um, so our first experiments were with the human scanner but using uh, animals. And this is one of the first mice um, this is a, a transgenic um, uh, mouse model of prostate cancer, so it's a spontaneously occurring cancer, which has similar etiology to human cancer. <coughs> this is a section down through the body of the mouse. This is a cross-section that goes through the mouse's kidney, and this is a cross-section that's going through the prostate tumor, which is here in the abdomen of the mouse. And these are the signals that we're measuring. This is a three-dimensionally localized um, uh, trace of uh, uh, four-dimensional data, three dim spatial dimensions, and one dimension of, of uh, spectral information. And these are just voxels that are picked out of these. This voxel is uh, focused on the kidney. And you can see here's the pyruvate that was injected. And here's the amount of lactate that was formed in that particular organ. You can see the relative intensity, the pyruvate's higher than the lactate. When we go to the tumor, we see the opposite occurs. The pyruvate's still pretty high because there's a, a fairly good delivery of the pyruvate, but a large amount of it is converted to lactate in the same time frame. And this was a 16 cubed array with a, a relatively 5 uh, millimeter on a side resolution and uh, acquired 35 seconds after we injected the pyruvate. Now, the first uh, thing that we investigated was uh, can we tell the difference between normal, early, and late-stage tumor, as well as metastatic tumor? And these were results that were done by my colleagues, John Kahanovitz and Dan Vigneron, and published several years ago. Um, clearly, the ratio of lactate to pyruvate was very different between the normal, uh, progressing to the early stage, and then when you get to the late stage in metastatic tumor, we see a very much larger intensity of lactate. So here we're uh, assuming that this is able to tell us about tumor aggressiveness. The next thing we were interested in evaluating was whether we could look at response to therapy. 
And these are two relatively large tumors, uh, pre-therapy and then five days post-androgen deprivation th uh, therapy, which is the most, one of the most common therapies given to people with prostate cancer. And the first one here is a responder. Uh, we see reduced tumor growth and low uh, uh, MIP staining uh, uh, in the pathology. And we see there's not that much difference in the size of the tumor because this is only five days different. If we look at the ratio of lactate to pyruvate, we see a complete reversal of the relative uh, signal intensities uh, from 1.8 ratio to 0.67. If we look at the non-responder, we see that there's very little change in the relative intensities, and in fact, the ratio even gets a little bit higher. So clearly, within a, a few days and a few days before, you can really see the changes at a biological basis in terms of apoptosis, etc. You are able to detect this metabolic change that is telling you whether the treatment is working. And this is really exciting in terms of the possibility in humans. Um, you could give a, a dose to a person, and then you could tell whether that treatment was going to work, and you could stop it if it didn't, it wasn't going to work, and you could continue if it was. So this made us very uh, excited. Uh, but then we got to the process of how do you go from that mouse to the person. So the first thing we did, as I said, was, was all of these rodent studies. The next thing that was done was imaging studies in dogs, because apparently a dog's prostate looks very much in imaging terms like a man's prostate. So that was very fortunate. We were able to get uh, dogs into our scanner and do our experiments. Um, what we wanted to do was to examine the dose effect to determine what kind of dose of this agent we needed and also confirm the data acquisition procedures. There were also a number of studies that needed to be done to get information to the FDA in order for them to give us permission to be able to do these experimental studies in people. So there was a non-imaging safety study of injecting a, a carbon-12 labeled compound into young volunteers within the dose range that we anticipated giving. And that gave us an idea of the dose that could be given. There was a second dose uh, a study um, that was uh, done in older individuals and showed no uh, uh, adverse effects. So we were pretty confident in the FDA, given all the data that we gave them, were confident and allowed us the possibility to continue with these. Now, the second thing was, you can't just inject anything into people. You have to do it in a sterile environment. So because of the time limitations involved in, get, in making this compound, polarizing and getting it to the individual, we had to create a very small clean room that was directly adjacent to our magnet room. And we had to hire a couple of very talented individuals that were actually going to generate the compound, very rapidly test that it met all of the safety criteria, and then put it through this little hatch here into the scan room in order to be able to inject it into the person. And here's a, a, a clean room manager, Jose Chang, all set up in his bunny suit under this sterile environment. And believe me, it is an art to be able to create a clean room that has the appropriate conditions. Uh, I really found out a lot more about clean rooms than I would ever want to know. <laughs> uh, this is the, the, the process that we had to go through in order to confirm that the compound we're injecting was actually safe. Um, you had to test the pH, uh, the weight of the compound, the temperature of the compound to make sure that you hadn't made it either too hot or it wasn't still too cold, and also the color because the electron donor uh, was something that uh, we needed to remove. So there's a, a column here, a, C a C18 column, that actually fil uh, filters out the electron donor, and uh, which it happens to be green, so you would be able to see it fairly easily. And so we end up with a colorless compound that we're able to inject into the individual. Uh, this all has to happen within about 20 seconds, and then there are four green lights that go on, and the person that is uh, watching those lights um, says, yes, it's okay to inject. If anyone comes up, up uh, red, then it was not possible to inject it. We had to have this window um, through which you could see what was going on in the clean room. Because it was a compounding process, we had to have a pharmacist to give this approval, a fully qualified pharmacist, pharmacists, they watch through the window, they see the green lights, or red lights, and say, yes, go, no, go, and then everybody starts running frantically in order <laughs> to be able to get this compound uh, injected into the individual. So let's, what about the experimental setup? Well, you one had to develop, uh, because most uh, MR scanners are focused on detecting protons, um, one had to develop radiofrequency coils that were able to detect uh, carbon-13 level compounds. 
This was developed by uh, Jim Trapp and uh, Paul Calderon at GE. It's a, a transmit coil which transmits the carbon-13 signals. And because we wanted to look at the prostate, uh, we were using an endorectal coil, which is able to track to receive signals of both carbon frequencies and proton frequencies. And now, to give you reference, this is a dog, not a person. This is the rectum, and the coil is, is sitting here underneath the prostate. This is the prostate that we're looking at. These are five millimeter uh, in size voxels, um, and you can see um, it's a pretty small organ within the center of the body. Uh, one would not be able to make it as accessible without using the center rectal coil. I should say, you may be thinking that this is not very comfortable. Well, of course, it isn't very comfortable, but the men who have prostate cancer actually go through a lot of these kind of exams and are very happy to be able to have a diagnostic technique um, that is able to uh, provide them with uh, confidence uh, about the, the findings in their tumor. And here was some of the first data. Um, this is a map of pyruvate, and this is a map of lactate that was formed uh, after injecting this normal dark prostate. And we were able to see signal to noises of in the hundreds, so very high signal to noise um, of both of the compounds. And here's a three dimensional localization. These are slices, axial slices through the prostate. And here's the overlay of the metabolism on top of those axial slices. Here's an example uh, in a person. And this was one of our first problems. We discovered that the first version of this uh, uh, carbon-13 transmit coil actually uh, decreased the, uh, the quality of our proton coil. And it had to be redesigned in order to be able to get rid of this shading. Um, but these are the kind of anatomic images that are required. An axial image, and here's the rectum, here's the a little um, standard that was sitting in the center of the coil. You can see the prostate is here. This is a sagittal uh, view when you can quite clearly, clearly see where the coil was. And here's a T2 weighted image, which is the one that's usually used for uh, diagnosis uh, of the, the disease. And these are a coronal, so um, slicing in the opposite direction, as well as a, a post uh, um, scan. So what we found is that sometimes when you inject this, this uh, solution, people move around a little bit. So we did a scan pre and post acquisition in order to make sure that the subject did not move too much. So how, did we, how are we going to design this uh, clinical trial uh, in order to be able to inject these people? Well, the, the goal was to confirm the safety of doing the injection and to establish the optimal dose. And we really wanted to make sure that the people that we were injecting had some cancer. We really wouldn't be any good if we didn't know that there was some cancer there. Uh, we also wanted to determine the appropriate timing. Remember, this had not been injected and followed ever. So we needed to be able to do some dynamic imaging in order to be able to find where the peak uh, bolus of the, the compound got there. And really to get an idea of the signal to noise ratio and determine the kinetics uh, um, of the process both of the delivery as well as of the metabolism that we're interested in. So what we chose to do was to, was to identify men who were on watchful waiting. They'd had prostate, uh, biopsy confirmed prostate cancer, and they were being followed to see what was going to happen to them. So relatively um, non-aggressive cancers, but something where the patient had undergone a similar examination, but without the carbon-13 part previously, and had not had any treatment, so treatment was not going to confuse the picture. We decided to do three doses, uh, six patients at each dose, and then expand to 15 additional patients in order to be able to look at the biology of the, of the tumor. And here is the very first real data that we got. Um, the the uh, in this first examination, what we were doing was acquiring slabs down through the prostate uh, with a three-second time resolution and getting dynamic data over a period of a couple of minutes. Um, this was a, from the slab here on the um, side that didn't have cancer, so benign disease. Maybe it was a, a benign disease, maybe it was normal, we're not sure, of course. And this was the pyruvate, and there was no uh, lactate uh, detected. This was from a slice that goes down through where the tumor was, and a uh, biopsy confirmed tumor was. Here's the pyruvate, here was the lactate, and here was the <laughs> urea standard that we just see a little bit of that was sitting down here in the middle of the coil. And then, of course, we could look at the time resolution, determine when the maximum uh, pyruvate was, when the maximum lactate was. That could allow us to uh, do some additional localization by having a, a 
single acquisition at that time point. And this was the very lowest dose, so it was really exciting to get this first data. Um, I, I, the overall results, and, and I think really key was showing the feasibility. So here's our agent at 1.2 degrees Kelvin uh, in the polarizer. It took on average 18 seconds to do the dissolution, to go from 1.2 to uh, um, normal temperature. Um, the quality control, so the assessment of pH and, and weight and uh, color, and et cetera, was done in an average of 13 seconds. Um, it took about 20 to 22 seconds to get the compound from the uh, bench into the, uh, through the hatch into the scan room. And then it took about 15 seconds on average to do the injection. We had one person collecting the sample, giving it to our nurse, who then drew it into a syringe and then injected it directly into a line that had already been set up. So this whole, uh, uh, whole process took about 68 seconds uh, on average um, to get to the patient. We were able to do the full three doses um, and the range of amount that was injected, this is in, uh, in uh, cubic centimeters, so between 10 to 15, uh, 14 cc's on average, depending obviously the weight of the individual. And then even at the highest dose, we were in the range of about uh, 30 to 40 cc's of the agent. And I apologize that this has gone a little bit out of skew, but the, the main polarization that we got out um, was uh, 18, nearly 18%, and um, with a relatively tight, uh, tightly coupled. And I think you, you already saw this one in the introduction, but this, this is the kind of data that one could acquire. This was a clinical staging exam that was acquired prior to our uh, carbon-13 examination. Um, so this, we would already knew that you could see an imaging abnormality on this side of the prostate, shown quite clearly by this dark region. We'd also done a proton spectroscopy data acquisition, which is using the intrinsic metabolites within, within the prostate. And this is a, these are spectra that come from that area. And I've highlighted in, in uh, red the area that was seen to be abnormal according to the metabolic signals which exactly corresponds to the anatomic abnormality. This is our actual carbon-13 exam, where we did first of all the imaging and then the acquisition of the carbon-13 data, and this is approximately the same size as that one. But in this case, you can see that there's two red areas, and we, uh, what we did was to detect a signal from the opposite side of the prostate. And of course, of interest is whether that really truly was tumor, uh, fortunately, we were able to uh, um, both look at the, the prior biopsies from this subject, which confirmed that there were biopsies, uh, that there was cancer on both sides of the prostate, as well as there was a subsequent image-guided biopsy that confirmed this, is, this in fact was cancer. So here, um, even in our, I think this was about the 15th or 16th patient, we were able to already see something uh, based upon our metabolism that we had not been able to see with a conventional imaging, which is really exciting. And here's just some examples of other, uh, uh, of the conventional data on another subject. This particular subject had a relatively uh, large tumor and probably should not have been uh, being followed with uh, watchful waiting. Uh, as is the synonym for not, basically not doing anything, monitoring the patient. Um, you can see the, the abnormality that spreads throughout multiple slices on this individual. This is another kind of uh, imaging, diffusion-weighted imaging, that is also applied. I think uh, as we move forward in the clinic, multi-parametric imaging and using multiple different kinds of information is really very key to being able to do proper diagnosis and monitoring the patients. So it can confirm here that this uh, dark region corresponding to the diffusion abnormality uh, also corresponded to the T2-weighted abnormality, and this was a very large region of tumor. Then when we looked at it with our metabolic signals, we were also able to confirm, and this is just the, pyruvate to, the, the lactate to pyruvate ratio, which again confirmed very nice localization of the metabolic signal in the area that we anticipated would be tumor based upon our other imaging modalities. Uh, this patient uh, went on to have uh, treatment, not because of our result. And uh, 
I've shown you two results, but uh, we, we did do many uh, patients. Overall, we were able to scan uh, 31 patients. There were only two patients uh, for whom the injection didn't work, and that was because of failure of the hardware, not because of failure of the polarization method. It was the, the QC hardware that, actually the pH measurement um, that failed, the pH meter that failed, as opposed to the very complicated uh, polarizer uh, material. Uh, but these are other examples. These are each individual patients, in each case, showing that there's a, a focus of metabol abnormal me metabolism in regions of the prostate. Um, most of these were able to be confirmed based upon approximate localization, based upon the original biopsy results, or were consistent with the standard imaging results. Uh, unfortunately, we were not able to retrospectively go back in and get biopsies for all of these subjects. That will be a future study. So what kind of uh, conclusions will we be able to make from this study and, and where, where is this all going? Um, we found it was a highly successful result. It took us a lot longer to get from A to B than we expected. I said several years. Um, originally, when uh, this was being planned, people came to us and said, it's going to take about two years from time A to time B. It, in fact, took about five years to actually get to this study, um, which was mainly a redesign of the clean room, re redesign of the polarizer experiment, redesign of the, of, the, uh, um, of the RF coils in order to be able to optimize that component of it. As I mentioned, we had 31 uh, patients who received this injection uh, that passed all of the QC tests and uh, were able to, uh, to be uh, delivered. As I mentioned, two patients underwent the imaging component of the exam, but not the C13 component due to failure of this QC system. The highest dose was reached and there were no uh, abnormal events that were dose limiting. There were some very minor events such as abnormal taste or, uh, or uh, um, a subsequent uh, uh, feeling of uh, being uncomfortable, but nothing that met the, uh, required, the uh, requirements of being dose limiting. There was relatively low signal in the normal prostate and four to five fold differences in the rate of conversion. In addition to doing this spatial localization, we were also estimated the dynamic changes in the signal and fitted a rate constant to these uh, dynamic curves and found that within the tumor, we could get a four to five fold higher uh, rate constant that was estimated. We believe that this may be the way going forward to be able to get uh, correct for the fact that we have all of the, the variable quantitative results. Obviously, if you pick a single time point to do your acquisition, it's going to depend on exactly when the delivery was. You really want to be able to model the signal and do something more sophisticated. And the other thing that we found was that the elevated lactate to pyruvate results were really in good agreement with our biopsy results in some cases not as well seen um, uh, in the staging in our examination. So now we've done the first study, where do we go from here? Well, I think, I think you can all imagine that it's not practical to have a clean room next door to every MR exam, uh, MR scanner. So the next stage has been um, for the manufacturer to be able to build a system that is able to operate without being in a clean room, so has a closed sterile fluid path that's able to do the entire process and to deliver you a sample. And that has actually been constructed. We have a prototype version in our lab, and there's actually, I think, already half a dozen different labs across the world that have a version of that polarizer. Um, the additional advantage in, in, uh, in this new polarizer design is that there are four different, it can polarize four different samples simultaneously and able to do all the quality control within that system. Uh, we're at the stage of uh, optimizing that, uh, the whole process and being able to get data that we can send to the FDA in order to get our IND re, re, uh, re, uh, reissued in order to be able to test this new examination. And of course, really the key now is uh, can we detect treatment response? So our very next study in prostate cancer is to be looking at subjects who have uh, before treatment and after treatment to really see whether we can see the same thing that we saw in the mouse in the man. And from my perspective, really don't care too much about the prostate. I want to move it up to the brain. And so we're also 
uh, developing the radio frequency coils and the uh, data acquisition methods to be able to do similar things in the brain. Now I wanted to acknowledge all of my colleagues, a very large number of people at UCSF and the Surbeck Laboratory, as well as a number of really critical uh, collaborators from Stanford, from the uh, Department of Electrical Engineering at Stanford, and as well as our pharmacy collaborators and our urology collaborators and the industry partner that we've been working with in this G in GE Healthcare. I want to highlight here sort of one of the most important things in doing science, and that's in celebrating every time something um, successful <laughs> happens. This was actually our first injection of our human, uh, and we didn't get signal from that. We didn't care. <laughs> what we, I'll explain why we didn't get signal. We actually began the acquisition too early, and we killed all the signal before it actually got to the person. But we didn't care. We just thought we should have a celebration. <laughs> the patient was safe, and we'd actually got a result. And then the second, uh, second exam, we actually did see significant signal. So I'd like to thank you for attention and um, see if you have any questions about it. Yeah. Excellent technique. Um, I have two questions about uh, the lactic to pyruvate ratio is very important. Yeah. Do you think that any other metabolites uh, can, like pyruvate? Yes. And the next, uh, second question is that can it replicate to other uh, cancers like uh, breast cancer, or colon cancer, or ovarian cancer? So uh, I take the second one first. Um, through preclinical experiments, we have worked on brain cancer, uh, uh, breast cancer, uh, lymphoma, um, think, what else? Uh, liver cancer. Um, pancreatic cancer. So yes, uh, we think it's a, it's a pretty general phenomenon for, for cancers. Um, we're not sure how well it's going to work for really low-grade tumors. So it's not something that we would envisage as being uh, an early detector of very small cancers that are maybe not so metabolically active. We really see the application as being response to therapy. Um, in terms of other compounds, um, Pyruvate is particularly nice because of the relaxation time of being approximately 60 seconds in blood. Uh, it really depends upon the uh, kinetics of the enzymatic process that you're talking about. There have been about 30 or 40 different compounds that have been polarized and have been examined. Uh, urea is one that is very, very, we're very successful with that can be used as a perfusion agent as an actual metabolic change. Um, fructose is another. Um, um, uh, glutamate, um, and uh, there's a whole list on our website of, of yes, so it, it really depends on the relaxation time of the agent and how clever you are in terms of being able to make that relaxation time long enough in order to be able to make a measurement. And then of course the enzymatic process that you're looking at in the biological tissue and whether that occurs within the time frame that is of interest. So I don't see this as being a panacea where you'll be able to detect everything, but there'll certainly be a, a number of very important compounds uh, that can be evaluated. The other key is that um, this, as the, the, the speed is a really good thing because this could be a very fast exam. Um, you can imagine instead of being an hour or an hour and a half long, you've really got something where you do some quick anatomic imaging and you get a result very rapidly. So that could be very nice. Sorry, um, we only had time for one question. Uh, and thank you so much for coming to our conference. And this is a gift for you. Thank you very much.